Welcome fellow Stardust. Thank you for joining me today. On this episode of True Crime and Nails, we'll be discussing Yardley Smith's Stalkers, the voice of beloved Lisa Simpson. I'm practicing another abstract design and finishing it off with a matte top coat. I'll first talk a little bit about Yardley's beginnings, and then we'll get into some of her horrifying experiences as she quickly becomes famous. Yardley Smith was born in Paris, France in 1964. Because she was born with a cleft palate, she and her family went to New York where doctors were able to correct it with surgery. They ended up staying in New York and that is where Yardley grew up. She labels her family as quote, upper crust and reserve. Her father was an editor for the Washington Post and her mother was a paper conservator at the Smithsonian Institute meaning she protected various artwork, archaeology, and museum collections. The rest of her family hold many prestigious roles. Some of these include historian, political scientist, sculptor, marine biologist, and more. Yardley says that her family believed in never showing weakness. This didn't mean that they didn't have any weaknesses, but only that they would not be shown to other people. Being a victim in any way, shape, or form was not an option for anyone in her family. Because of this, Yardley developed a strong sense of independence that carried her through her career. This would later be a trait that prevented her from making better decisions when her stalkers came into her life. Yardley knew from a very young age that she wanted to become an actress. She was in her first play in the sixth grade. About seven years later, in 1982, after graduating from drama school, she was on Broadway in the production of The Real Thing. Her film debut was in 1985 in the film Heaven Help Us and The Legend of Billie Jean. She was also in the only film that Stephen King ever directed. Maximum Overdrive. Then, in 1986, she got her first television role in the series Brothers. In 1987, she auditioned for the Simpsons shorts that were to play as bumpers on the Tracy Ullman show. She initially auditioned for the role of Bart. She only read a few words and thought for sure she didn't get the part, so she was surprised to get a call a few days later offering her the role of Lisa. Nancy Cartwright, who auditioned for Lisa, was then offered the role of Bart. After three seasons in 1989, The Simpsons spun off into its own 30-minute show. I mean, we get away with so much, yeah. but it's really true. I mean, we're not the Brady Bunch. We're a little sick. <laughs> and it's really funny. You personally are a little sick. Yes, personally. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, and that's for real, because I know you have this thing about horror films. You've been in a oh, couple. Oh, I do, yes. I did this um, Stephen King film, this Maximum Overdrive, and I can't bear horror films. When I was a kid, I was such a sissy, and I never went unless I was dragged, dragged, kicking and screaming. And um, it, when I finally made one, it was so funny, because here you see these guys with bottles of, you know, blood, not really blood, but chemicals that they've mixed up. They're spreading it all over the wall. They spend hours trying to figure out how to make this person look like his arm was cut off with globular globs of who knows what, and you just look, ew. I mean, it's like recipes. It was really funny. So have you become a fan of horror films? It's easier no. for you to watch them? No, you hate them. I hate them still. <laughs> In 1992, she and her husband divorced amicably, and this is when she begins to get creepy notes left on her door. They would be placed between the door and the door frame, so that when she opened the door, the note would flutter to the ground. This would occur every two or three days. It lasted for about two weeks before she finally went to Paul. He was an LAPD officer and owner of the security company hired to work on Herman's Head, another show she was on. By the time she went to him, she had accumulated five notes. One said, if I can't have you, no one can. Another said, I want to take you to heaven and make you mine. After getting this last note, she couldn't sleep anymore. Her bedroom window faced the front yard, so the thought of her head being just feet away from the door where the notes were being left terrified her. 
Paul rounded up firefighters and other LAPD officers to stake out her house for six weeks. They believe they saw the man who had been leaving the notes, but the man also spotted the cops. After this, the notes stopped. At the same time this was happening, Yardley was also having to deal with her personal trainer, Ken. She was a member at 24 Hour Fitness and would attend the workout classes. One day, Ken came up to her and offered to be her personal trainer. He begged for a chance to let him show her what he could do. Unwilling to pass up an opportunity to improve herself, she gives in and agrees to work with him. Things started out fine. He worked her harder than she worked herself and she enjoyed that, but he slowly became more and more creepy. Their goodbyes got awkward because he would try to hug her and eventually he even tried kissing her on the mouth. She recalls being scared to tell him, you can't do that. Sometimes she would leave without saying goodbye but the next day he would confront her about it, asking her why she would leave without telling him goodbye. He would also buy her revealing gym clothes that she never wore. At one point, he offered her a real estate opportunity, only for her to later find out that he had been living in his car. This was the last straw for Yardley. She quit training with him and discontinued her membership to the gym. She told Ken the reason she was quitting was because she was late to work on The Simpsons every time they trained. She probably could have come up with something better, but oh well. Of course, we immediately think that maybe this Ken guy and the guy who was leaving her notes on the door could be the same person. These two things were happening at the same time, so I would say it's a possibility. However, maybe the cops were able to confirm that the man they saw while staking out her house looked nothing like Kim. She doesn't really go into much detail about this when she tells her story. After all of this, she buys a new home and decides to put the house in the name of a living trustee. This would prevent people from being able to find out where she lived. And while this was a good measure to take, she still ran into trouble before even moving into her new home. Yardley, where'd the idea for Lisa come from? Uh, I, I think uh, I sort of only had two voices in me. When I first actually read for The Simpsons, I read for Bart. Uh -huh. And uh, Nancy, who does the voice of Bart, was there and she was reading for Lisa and then we swapped and that was it. And, was like, <laughs> and, and it's just and slightly we... higher than my normal range. I think I sound most like myself of all the characters on the show, actually. She started to hire different people to do contract work on the house. When she hired someone to work on the floors, she didn't realize that the company she hired was going to then contract the work out to another subcontractor. So the floor guy introduced her to the subcontractor, Vince. She says when they met, she felt he stared at her a bit too long and really made it a point to lock eyes with her. He then said to her, I knew when I saw you on TV that I would meet you one day. With her independent attitude, she decided that it was no big deal, nothing that she couldn't handle. So she just chalked it up to him being an overly excited fan and shrugged it off. It probably wasn't the best idea to ignore that huge red flag. Now, when she tells this story, she repeatedly says how embarrassed she feels about the decisions she made throughout this whole ordeal. And while I don't think she should be embarrassed, there are a lot of moments in the story where you might say to yourself, well, why didn't she do this or that? But when you're in the middle of something like that, it's hard to know exactly what you would do. This was also happening three years after the shooting of Rebecca Schaefer in 1989. Rebecca was a 21-year-old model and actress who had been stalked by 19-year-old Robert John Bardo for three years. Before becoming obsessed with Rebecca, he was stalking child peace activist Samantha Smith until she died in a plane crash in 1985 at the age of 13. Robert started sending Rebecca a bunch of letters and she ends up responding to one of them. In 1987, Robert Bardo went to Warner Brothers to try to meet Rebecca, but he was turned away by security. He tried again a month later and this time he had a knife with him. After being turned away again, he went back home to Tucson, Arizona. He actually lost interest in Rebecca for a while 
and shifted his focus to other celebrities. But Rebecca then is in a movie where in one of the scenes, she is in bed with a man. This infuriated Robert because this now made her a Hollywood floozy like the rest of them. He then hired a detective agency for $250 to get Rebecca's address, who then got it from the DMV. When he got to her house, he showed her the letter and autographed photo that she had sent him. I'm sure he gave off some really creepy vibes because she then asked him to not return to her home. He left and ate breakfast at a diner not far from her house. Afterwards, he went back to Rebecca's house. He recalls her face looking cold. When she answered the door, he shot her in the chest. He says she fell back and said, why? The same year Yardley bought her house, in 1993, professional tennis player Monica Seelis had just been stabbed by an opponent's crazed fan. Luckily, she survived but wasn't able to play tennis the same way ever again. With more and more cases of stalking, especially of women in LA, California became the first state in the US to criminalize stalking. And just after 2000, all 50 states and DC had also criminalized stalking. Now getting back to Yardley, Vince begins working on her floor. And when he makes his way to the bathroom, he tells her that she's going to have to hire a plumber to move the toilet and also tells her that his brother is a plumber. After hiring his brother, he then tells her that the electricity needs some work and that he also knows an electrician who she then hires. So this goes on for a while until the house is almost completely done. After three weeks, Yardley moves in with just a few final touches left to be done. Then, on a Sunday, she gets a phone call and it's Vince. Sounding distressed, he tells her that he needs to see her in person. Feeling a bit rattled, but still maintaining her independent attitude, she says to herself it's no big deal and agrees to meet with him. When he gets to her house, she notices red marks on his neck and arm. Right away, he tells her that he's killed two men for her and that she needs to pay him $20,000 for it. He said that two men had been following her and knew everything about her. He comments that she's not very aware of her surroundings and that she almost never looks in her rearview mirror. Even though she was scared in the moment, she remembers thinking to herself that $20,000 wasn't enough money for killing two people. And to be honest, that was the first thought that popped into my head too. She asked to see photos as proof which upset Vince. And he said, You freaking don't believe me? I look out for you. He told her that he followed them into a bar in Hollywood and then took them out back where a hitman he hired took care of them. He also said that the bodies were taken to a cement factory in Mexico and that their bodies would be mixed in with one of the batches of cement. Vince then says he needs to call the hitman and uses her phone in her kitchen. She can hear the person on the other end say, it's done, I want my money. He replies, okay, I'll be there soon. After hanging up, he tells Yardley he's screwed if he doesn't get the hitman the $20,000. She tells him that she can't pay him the money because she doesn't have cash like that sitting around. And if she were to write a check for that amount, it would have her accountant questioning her. So he suggested that she write checks out for smaller amounts addressed to the different subcontractors he convinced her of hiring and to then leave the check in the electrician's mailbox. She said she'll think about it. He then warns her that if she goes to the police that they would both be killed. Yardley tells him he better go since the hitman is waiting on him. And as he leaves, he places both hands on her shoulders, looks into her eyes and says, Yardley, Yardley, Yardley. I wanted to call you last night and tell you I love you and I'll take care of you and don't worry. Yardley didn't go to the police or anyone after this incident, even though this man still had keys to her house. Vince gave her a deadline of Tuesday to have the money ready. Knowing she wasn't going to pay him, she sort of just let the time pass without doing anything. Finally, on Tuesday, she sort of accidentally mentions the exchange to her friend, who tells her she needs to call the police immediately. Yardley says she thought that the police wouldn't believe her, but she decided that when she got home, she would call Paul, the police officer who had helped her out the last time. 
When she got home from lunch with her friend, before she could call him, she got a call from Vince. He was angry and asked why she hadn't left him the money yet. She tells him that if he did in fact kill these two men, that she couldn't possibly condone what he had done. And if he hadn't killed them, then why would she leave him any money? He replies with, I see. I do all the work and you say screw Vince. She tells him she's gotta go and hangs up. She immediately leaves her house and drives two miles away to call Paul. She tells him she's afraid to be at home again and after telling him everything, he asks why she didn't go to him sooner and she tells him that she thought she could handle it. So he plans to have his guys stake out her house again for another six weeks. Vince's tools are still in her garage. So while Paul is there, she calls him to ask him to come pick them up. Even though Paul was careful to stay very quiet, Vince was still able to hear a tiny noise which prompted him to ask who was there. She said no one, but he immediately hung up the phone. He never came to get his tools, so Paul called him up one day telling him exactly who he was and offered to bring him his tools. Vince finally agrees to meet Paul at a Taco Bell, but at the last minute, changes the location to an Arby's. This raised a red flag for Paul. So when he left to go meet up with Vince, he left Yardley a gun and told her to shoot to kill if he showed up. In hindsight, she wishes she would have gone to a friend's house and waited instead of waiting at home alone. When Paul came back, he told her that Vince is basically harmless, but that he does have some screws loose. I'm not sure how a person like that can be deemed harmless, but okay. Luckily, he stuck with the plan of staking out her house for six weeks. Vince ended up driving by her house twice during that time, and both times the police went after him. Yardley later found out that he was in prison for domestic violence. After going through these three incidents in six months, she also got a P.O. box so that her mail didn't go to her house and she did everything else she could to keep her personal information private. Despite all of her efforts, fans still know when she is going to land somewhere. When she asks people how they knew she would be there, sometimes they reply with, the flight attendant told me, which angers her because it's a violation of privacy. Although she chooses not to live in fear, in the back of her mind, she still worries that one day she'll be shot like Rebecca Schaefer. I mean, this is great. You're in Herman's head, yeah. so you're on camera. You're behind with Lisa Simpson. I mean, you have like a golden career happening. I do. I always have, actually. I really am one of the lucky ones. Right from the start, I mean, my start was like, I took off like a shot. Have you ever had a regular job? No, no. What was that? What was that face? When because there are lots of people who go, ah, you don't deserve it. You never worked a day in your life. You didn't go to school. You never paid your dues. You hey, know. To hell with them. Well. Tell them, Yardley. You're doing it. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the Thank show today. You. And it's Donut Friday, so uh, if you'd like. I, I'm we'll, trying we'll, to quit. Thanks. No, I, well, no, but we'll put it in a Ziploc bag and you can eat it in the subway or That's something. That's so kind of you. Thank you again for joining me today, fellow Stardust. I hope I see you next time. Peace. Yeah.